Rudy, and I'm going to be telling you about uh, gamesmanship and how uh, someone like Joe Marler is a prime example of uh, how gamesmanship kind of uh, is played with a sport like rugby. Who is Joe Marler? Joe William George Marler, born 7th July 1990, is an English professional rugby union player. He played for Harlequins in the Gallagher Premiership, playing primarily as prop. Marla was captain for England at under-18s level and represented the under-20 squad and made his test debut for England as loose head prop against South Africa in the summer of 2012. He soon became a regular feature to the squad and so far has 60 caps for England. On the 19th of April 2017, Marla was one of 41 players selected for the British and Irish Lions tour to New Zealand in June of July that year, making five appearances for the squad. What is gamesmanship? Gamesmanship is the use of dubious, although not technically illegal, methods to win or gain a serious advantage in a game or sport. It has been, it has been described as pushing the rules to the limit without getting caught, using whatever dubious methods possible to achieve the desired end. A common example would be a footballer taking a dive or making a foul perceived worse than it is. The aim is to get an advantage in the game, such as a penalty or winning the referee's favour, and sometimes rile or weaken the opponent's morale. However, in recent years, gamesmanship has been clamped down on in sportsmen, and people can't get away with what they used to before. What does he do? When it comes to gamesmanship, Joe Marler plays a very old-school style of rugby. He seems to irritate, rile up the opposition. In the scrum, he's been known to pinch, kick, poke, and gouge oppositions. He doesn't look to hurt the opponent, but to annoy them and hopefully cause them to make mistakes later on in the game. The hair. One thing that makes Joe Muller stand out is his hair, constantly changing, always bright, always vibrant. He does this to somewhat distract his opponent, and it works. He's known for his hair, and oppositions fear the sight of the red mohawk running towards them. The Incident In March 2020, during a Six Nations match against Wales, Joe Muller grabbed Alwyn Jones' genitals and was banned from playing for 10 weeks. As a result of the coronavirus lockdown, the ban ended up with Marla missing, without Marla missing any matches since every fixture that Marla could have played was, was, postponed, was postponed. I've lost count of the number of people who have touched my genitals in the game of rugby, said Danny Kerr. This incident was an obvious example of gamesmanship. Joe's aim to cause a small amount of harmless chaos to affect the game. However, it backfired and the media blew the incident out of proportion, leading to his ban. Thank you for listening. Hello everybody, uh, as you can see this talk is going to be on the logistics of an expedition to Mars. If you have any questions about the talk, please be sure to post them in the chat. So firstly, why do we explore? So socially, as humans, we are driven to explore the unknown, discover new worlds, push the boundaries of our science and technological limits. We all want to know what's going on around us, it's in our nature. Space exploration helps us to address the fundamental questions of our planet in the universe and the history of our solar system. Through addressing these challenges uh, related to human exploration, uh, we expand the technological limits, create new industries, and help foster peaceful connections with other nations. So why Mars? Uh, robotic missions have found evidence of water, uh, as well as that Mars shows many characteristics uh, which point to a similar history uh, of Earth. Uh, in addition, it has water at the poles. Um, it's the closest planet to Earth, or is one of the most suitable closest planets to Earth. Um, and it has sort of a, an atmosphere which we are able to influence to make it have a more of an atmosphere that we can use to survive better on. Okay, so the conditions of Mars. So first we're going to look at distance. So Mars is the fourth planet in the solar system. It has a distance of 227.9 uh, million kilometres from the Sun. This compares to Earth, which has a distance of the Sun uh, of 149.7 million kilometers. Uh, Mars has a diameter of 4,220 uh, 4, uh, 20 miles. Um, this is just over half of Earth. Uh, Earth has a d uh, diameter of 6,926 uh, miles. Um, the diameter of Mars is around double Earth Moon, 
uh, with Earth's moon being um, 2,158 miles uh, diameter. Uh, th just, this makes it the smallest planet, planet only l larger than Mercury. Um, the length of a Mars year is 687 day Earth days, uh, and the length of a Mars day is just over 24 hours. Um, with So 24 hours and 37 minutes. Uh, which is very similar to Earth, with Earth's day being 23 hours and 56 minutes. Um, gravity, uh, the Earth, uh, the gravity of Mars is 3.711 uh, meters a second. This compares to the 9.81 meters a second uh, on Earth. Uh, this means that if you dropped an object on Earth in a vacuum, 10 meters, it would fall 10 meters in 1.4 seconds. Uh, where on Mars, if you dropped an item for 10 meters and timed how long it would take, this would take 2.3 seconds. Um, compared to the Moon, where the Moon has our Moon, the Moon has a gravity of 1.62 uh, meters a second, so it's about three times or just under three times of the Moon. Um, Mars has two moons. Phoebus, which means fear in Greek, has a radius of 11 kilometers, and Demios, which means fear in Greek. Um, of its Terra, sorry, uh, it has a radius of only six kilometers. Uh, both the moons were discovered in, nine, in 1877 by an American astronomer. So the atmosphere of uh, Mars, so carbon dioxide makes up 95.3%. Uh, this is about nine times the amount on Earth. Uh, the atmosphere is very thin, exerting less than 1% of the atmospheric pressure at the surface of Earth. Uh, there's only very small amounts of uh, water present today in the Martian atmosphere. Um, if all the water in the atmosphere precipitated out, it would form a layer of ice which is only 10 micrometers thick, which is 0.01 millimeters thick. Uh, despite the small amount of water present, the atmosphere is uh, nearly saturated uh, and water ice clouds are common. Uh, Mars atmosphere also consists of molecular, uh, molecules of nitrogen, a water vapor as we said, and the noble gases argon, neon, krypton, and xeon. Uh, generally high up in the atmosphere, uh, these include molecules such as oxygen, carbon dioxide, uh, nitric oxide, and small amounts of ozone. The temperature, uh, the temperature of the lower atmosphere is minus 70 uh, degrees centigrade. Uh, these values are in the same experienced in the Arctic on Earth in, during the winter. Uh, in the summer, the very dark surface can result of Mars can result in daytime temperatures peaking at around 17 degrees. So just like Earth, uh, Mars has polar regions in the northern hemisphere. Um, clouds develop over the polar regions and the caps are made of frozen carbon dioxide. Uh, the small caps in the north hemisphere extends to 55 latitude uh, and the larger one in the south extends to 50 latitude. Uh, this, uh, in the spring, frozen carbon dioxide uh, decreases um, in the, in the uh, poles. Uh, throughout summer, the carbon dioxide completely disappears. Uh, this results in leaving behind small uh, water ice caps. Um, this means that there is water on Mars, and this may point to there being life. Um, so there's already been quite a few um, missions to Mars. There. And here are a few pictures of them. So we now start to talk about SpaceX. So SpaceX in the Mars race. Um, so Elon Musk believes that the future will go down two paths. The first path will be that the humans and human race will stay on Earth forever and there will be some sort of extinction event. Um, maybe not the best to talk about right now. Uh, but anyway, uh, the second path is for humans to become a multi planetary species such as go to different planets such as Mars. Um, <clears throat> So the reason for why SpaceX chose our Mars, uh, this is because already there was a limited amount of planets to be created. These would be Venus, Mercury, Mars, and the Moon. Um, this is because these are the most closest planets, and we don't currently have the technology to be able to go as far, and it would take quite a long time to get to the planets. Um, so Venus has too high pressure atmosphere, as well as acidic. Um, the rain is acidic. Uh, Mercury is too close to the sun, so it's too hot, so we cannot sustain life. Um, the moon is much smaller than Earth, 
It is not rich of resources and has no atmosphere. Uh, so it would be a lot more um, resources required to make it uh, more sustainable. Uh, this meant Mars was a clear option with a thick atmosphere. Uh, it's closest, it has a closest closest Earth day, so it means the the, far, the, the rate at which it spins is closest to Earth. Um, it's cold, but as we've seen, it gets at higher 17 degrees and it's able to be warmed up by planting trees and the greenhouse effects. Um, the atmosphere is comprised of mostly CO2 and has nitrogen, which is very important for plant growth. Um, then go look into costing. So um, the current issue is that there's no intersect between the amount of people who want to go to Mars and the amount of people who are able to afford to go to Mars. Um, currently using traditional methods, it would cost, uh, cost $10 billion uh, per person to get to Mars. Um, what SpaceX wants to do is make it so that there's an intersect between the amount of people who want to go and the amount of people who want to aff who can afford to go who want to go. Um, that to do this, SpaceX aims to bring down the cost uh, of going to Mars to a medium cost of a house in the US, which is around uh, two hundred thousand um, pounds. To achieve this, there needs to be three main factors which need to be achieved. The first one is uh, getting full reusability of the spacecraft, um, refilling an orbit, and propellant production on Mars. This means that they don't have to take fuel with them, which adds weight, and so on. So, free, full reusability. Uh, Musk says that to make a um, trip to Mars possible on a large enough scale, we need to create a self sustaining city um, which is able to sustain itself without constant. Um, resources being sent from Earth. He also compares the space travel to commercial airlines. Uh, if planes were single use, uh, a flight from LA to Las Vegas would cost the per uh, each person around half a million dollars. Um, but because the plane is obviously reusable, this only costs around um, $43. Um, refilling orbit, as I mentioned before, this would allow the, uh, the rocket to have more fuel on it. So refilling orbit means that you load a uh, you send a rocket up so it orbits around the Earth, and then in several trips you take um, fuel to the rocket, so then it can go off to Mars. Um, this means that the rocket on the initial launch doesn't have to have as much weight, uh, which means it's much less expensive, uh, as well as it requires less materials to um, build the uh, fuel store canisters, as you could just reuse the same ones that goes up and down. Um, which again decreases the cost. Uh, okay, so here's an image of the basic plan of the journey. Uh, as you can see, what basically happens is that there are two parts of the rocket. You've got the booster, then the actual aircraft that's going to be going to Mars. So the aircraft, uh, the booster will launch the aircraft into a stable orbit. The booster will then return back to Earth, refuel, and launch other rockets so they can all be in a stable orbit together and then leave to Mars together. Um, this just means again that you only need to build one booster and then several rockets, so again saving on costs. And this booster will be able to be reused, so again you're not creating more boosters, etc. Um, that's that's the basic overview. Um, so the BFR, this will be made uh, from advanced car carbon fibre premium, uh, premium structure. Uh, the primary structure needs to be liquid and gas permeable, so that fluid won't leak through it, such as the um, fuel that's going to be used. Um, so the whole ship has a total height of 100 meters with a width of 10 meters. Uh, the booster, which is used by SpaceX, used 24 Raptor engines, at, uh, which at sea level produces um, 128 meganewtons of thrust, and in a vacuum, this will uh, increase to 138 meganewtons of thrust. Yeah. Um, that's just been a small overview on what the possible logistics of an expedition to Mars is. I uh, hope you enjoyed and thank you for listening. How has commercialisation affected Arsenal Football Club? Has it affected Arsenal positively or negatively? So the reasoning for me looking at this topic today is because it's my EPQ project and I chose this as my EPQ project because 
ultimately I'm an Arsenal fan, so I knew this would be something I'd be very interested in and be um, definitely looking to learn more about. And I thought the topic of commercialisation was was interesting as it's probably seen the biggest change in football out of um, anything. Also, I knew I could get some good sources from um, on this topic because I know many Arsenal fans of, of all ages, really, like my granddad's friends. Um, so I knew, I knew they'd be good sources because with this topic, there is a lot of good counter arguments, for example. Um, obviously, player wages has changed drastically from our grandparents' ages. Um, so they're going to have a different view on player wages than we are, even though we're going to still realise they're ludicrous. I think our grandparents are going to think even more so. And finally, I chose this um, topic because I knew I could get lots of websites and opinions on this topic. So there is loads and loads of websites covering Arsenal football content because obviously it's one of the world's most popular sports. So that, that would allow me to get loads of statistics and data that I can put all in my report to back up um, as evidence. So the topics I looked at in my project was match day tickets, um, investors, player wages, sponsorships and the fan base. So the first topic I'll be looking at is match day tickets. Uh, since 1981, there has been um, a 1,234% increase in match day tickets. Um, the ticket price is averaged at about three pound in 1981, and that is increased to 45 pound on average now, um, which is obviously a very big increase. But with the inflation of football, one that was was almost always going to happen. Um, the biggest increase was seen in the 91-92 season, where the tickets priced tickets increased by 38 percent. Um, the ticket, the price of the tickets went from seven pound twenty six to ten pound, which a three pound increase. If you if you look at ten years later, the the tickets were only costing three pound. So for them to increase by three pound was quite quite a big increase. Um, so yeah, since Arsenal moved to the Emirates in two thousand and six, there has been an increase of seventeen percent, which isn't that much if you look at how long that is. That's like fourteen years. And if you compare that to the 91-92 season, that's that's not a bad increase. So the increase has definitely steadied um, in more recent times. So the second topic I looked at in um, my EPQ was investors. And this was a topic that I knew would have changed a lot over the last, last few decades because of the new influx of money into football. So Arsenal in 1962 to 1982 was owned by Dennis Hillwood. Um, who was a typical British lad who went to Oxford and played cricket. Um, when he died, he passed his shares over to Peter Hillwood, who was his son, um, who, again, typical British lad, um, really represented the, the values and t traditional British values of Arsenal in England um, at that time. Um, but Peter then sold their family shares to David Dane in the 80s and the rest of Stan Kroenke in the 90s. Um, David Dane left in 2007 um, and even Gazidis arrived. Even Gazidis was South African so he this saw the back of the, the traditional English owners of Arsenal and almost um, displayed a new a new way that Arsenal were going to be looking at their investors because there was more money outside of England. Um, so Arsenal is now owned by Stan Kroenke, who owns 67%, and Alicia Uzmanov, probably butchered that, but he now owns 30% uh, of Arsenal. So the main shares are coming from America and Russia. Um, and an interesting um, story about this topic is I went to a conference with Arsene Wenger, and he said he predicted in the 2000s that by 2020, um, there will be barely any English owners in the in the Premier League because of the the inflation of money um, and how much football was costing. So the third topic I looked at in my EPQ was player wages, and this is the one that has seen the most inflation and has probably got the most opinions on um, by by football fans around the world. Um, so the first reliable source I could find um, showed that Arsenal had an annual salary bill 
1992 um, 93 season of 7.7 million and this is minute compared to the um, registered salaries annual salary of the 1920 season which was uh, around 240 uh, million pounds um, so Burkamp arrived in 1995 on a 19 um, thousand pounds a week um, salary. Um, Burkamp was was one of Arsenal's best ever players, and he he if he was in today's market would be earning absolutely bonkers amounts of money. Um, but this this compares to Mesut Ozil, who's on three hundred and fifty um, grand a week now, and it's fair to say Ozil right now is nowhere near the levels of Burkamp was at. So that that just shows the. Um, the vast inflation of, of player wages in in over in, in around twenty years. Um, so yeah, an an, an interesting um, point that Arsene Wenger made on player wages was someone asked him has has money taken a soul out of um, playing football, and his reply was, um, if you love the sport internally, uh, you'll play for the love of the sport, and money won't have a have an effect. But he said. There is a lot of people that love love football externally and love the love the lifestyle and don't actually love the sport as much as they should, and that is because of the money and social media, how it how it conveys players' lifestyles. With obviously, like in this picture, Aubameyang having a Lamborghini, like who who, who doesn't want that? But um, it 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 really really um, made a point that a lot of people are playing football for the money and not not exactly for the sport. Um, so the third topic I looked at in my EPQ was sponsorships, and sponsorships have changed again a lot with with the inflation of the the football market and uh, commercialisation has become a lot lot more of a bigger um, aspect of football. So the first main uh, sponsorship deal Arsenal got was in 1999 from Sega, um, which was a three year contract, um, and Sega paid four million pounds a year to Arsenal. Um, so it's a contract worth twelve million pounds. Um, this this sponsorship from Sega was part of a 50, 50 million pound marketing um, strategy, where they also sponsored um, Saint Etienne in France and Sampdoria in Italy, um, as obviously they they identified that football was becoming a lot more accessible for people to watch, and there was a lot of money money in the sport. So it was part of their marketing strategy to get their get their name out there. In uh, using football, um, in 2006, um, Fly Emirates became uh, the main kit sponsor for Arsenal in a deal worth 100 million um, pounds, and that lasted um, until 2019, which was then extended um, until 2024 in a deal worth 200 million, and that really shows in that in that short um, period of time of 10 about 10 15 years that sponsorship deals can can really go through the roof in um, that short time. So in 2014, Puma started a uh, £150 million kit sponsor deal with Arsenal, which lasted five years. Um, so that that's about £30, pillion, pillion, £30 million pounds a year for Arsenal um, to be sponsored and manufactured by Puma. This was then trumped by Adidas in 2019, where they came along and gave Arsenal £300 million pound, um, in kit sponsor deal, um, which is is one of the biggest kit sponsor deals in in all of football. Final topic I looked at in my EPQ was fan base. Um, this is a topic that has seen a large amount of growth in recent years because of the use of social media and a greater accessibility to um, TVs. Um, and this is backed up because Arsenal have reported 125 million fans worldwide. Um, with a following of 62 million on all social media platforms. Um, Arsenal, I think, started in 2013, started competing in the Asia Trophy Cup, which is a pre-season tournament which takes place in Asia, um, where they played the likes of Real Madrid, Bayern Munich, Barcelona, all top clubs in, in which is really an attempt to grow their Asian fan base. Um, this is because football is growing in Asia, the Chinese Super League started up and has invested lots of money in in growing football in Asia, and Arsenal have seen this as an opportunity opportunity to 
create more revenue by getting Asian fans to, to come over and watch Arsenal and such. Um, another thing that really, really formed a, a bigger fan base for Arsenal uh, was in the 1980s because they were, they were, they were shown to be one of the, the first more diverse clubs. Um, as they were one of the first clubs to have famous black males playing in a top, in a top English club. Um, and this is through a young team coming through the academy of um, David Rowcastle, Paul Davies and Michael Thomas. And these all competed in a, a successful Arsenal team. And this was later seen through the likes of Ian Wright coming to play for Arsenal. All top English um, black males, which which in those times was still, football was still being played by white males. Um, so Arsenal really showed their diversity early on more than um, any other clubs, which uh, increased their likability, I guess. So to conclude my, my presentation and my talk about my EPQ, uh, I'll talk to you about some of my favourite sources. The first, the first one was um, I went to a conference which was uh, a charity event and Arsene Wenger and Pat Rice were there and it was a QA, and a and they covered a lot of topics from when Arsene Wenger was obviously manager um, and when Pat Rice played and Pat Rice is obviously still well involved in the club now. So it, it, allowed, it allowed me to get a lot of information for my APQ um, on, on the likes of how the finances have changed, how football has changed, and a lot of a lot of good and reliable data that I could put into my my project. Um, another another one of my favourite sources is just speaking to people and speaking to people that have been long term Arsenal fans because I think one of the main the main things with doing this as my as um, my APQ is it's very opinion based and there is a lot of arguments and there is a lot of reasons for and against many aspects of what I've looked at. So for to speak to loads of Arsenal fans and get an accumulation of loads of opinions can really help me um, conclude what what I am taking out of uh, the questions I'm asking. And the final one I looked at was a bleach report on the Arsenal kits from the far previous 50 years. And I just really enjoyed this this source because it allowed me to have a visual representation of how the kits have changed, how sponsorships have come onto the kits. And obviously you can see in this picture in the bottom right hand corner, there's no there's no kit sponsor in this shirt. And if you look at the Arsenal kit sponsor now, there's there's the Fly Emirates and Visit Rwanda on there. So obviously kit sponsors have um, become a very uh, relevant thing for, for football clubs. So that is that is the end of my, my presentation. Um, thank you for listening. And hope you learn learn a bit about Arsenal. Hello everybody, uh, this is Mr Locke speaking. I'm really delighted to have this opportunity to talk to you today about uh, one of my favourite topics, uh, cinema, world cinema, in particular today, French cinema, the birth of the seventh art, uh, Les Frères Lumières. Now, the uh, more discerning uh, listeners, viewers, uh, will be aware of the character Lumière from the Disney classic Beauty and the Beast. However, that is not the Lumiere that I intend to talk about today. No, in actual fact, I'm going to be talking about these two gentlemen, Auguste and Louis Lumiere, who uh, are dead now. Uh, but they were very important in uh, the history of French cinema. Okay, uh, so I'm going to explain a little bit more about them later. Um, I'm just going to flash up on the screen uh, some other art forms because you might be wondering why the seventh art. Well, uh, we've got the um, architecture, sculpture and painting here on the left, music, poetry and dance on the right. Uh, these are a number of uh, ancient arts and actually in the 1920s 
um, it was decided that cinema in its own right was an art form and became the seventh art. Now you, like me, uh, a long time ago, probably thought about uh, blockbuster movies, Hollywood, multiplexes, popcorn, these days Netflix as well, film star lifestyles, all the classics, um, uh, when you think about cinema. But uh, where did this all come from? Um, the history of film began actually back in the 1890s um, when motion picture cameras were invented and film uh, production companies started to be established. Um, and back in the 1890s, because of the limits of technology, uh, films tended to be um, under a minute long. Now we're going to be exploring some of these films later, but just how did we get to that point where people were making films? Well, there was this chap here called Edward Moybridge, and he uh, invented something called the Zoopraxis scope, which you may have seen before. This was a series of photographs um, in a cylinder, and that you would look through slits in the side or in mirrors, and you would see a, su a succession of photographs that were all slightly different. And if you've ever drawn a flip book on the corner of an exercise book, not that you would ever do that, but um, you can flip the papers and you change them slightly. It's like a kind of really basic um, uh, form of animation that's quite fun to do. And um, this is a kind of more sophisticated way of doing that. Um, and I just want to show you this short clip here, which was a, a series of photographs um, that are shown in succession to give the impression of movement. Now, this, in fact, actually came on um, film, moving images as an art form um, with traditions in, in earlier fields, such as storytelling, literature, theatre and, and visual arts um, and you may be familiar with such things as um, camera obscura or shadow puppetry, um, magic lanterns uh, and all sorts of different movements as well but this is really the first uh, kind of um, moving images that we ever see and I um, I find this really impressive uh, obviously black and white uh, no colour back in those days but this was very um, pioneering at the time and you could all you could almost say that this is the first movie projector um, this is rotating glass discs um, in a rapid succession to give an impression of movement um, that was in 1890 moving on you may have heard of Thomas Edison he invented the light bulb but he also uh, invented what he called the kinetoscope. Now, kinetoscope is the name deriving from Greek roots, uh, kineto, like the word kin uh, kinesthetic, to do with movement, and skopos, to do with view, so viewing movement. And this is, ba uh, this is back in 1891. Um, and as you can see here, um, it's a very large machine, and only one person can actually look um, in at, the, at, at once. Um, and they, this was a bit of a flaw at the time, but it was in actual fact um, a hugely pioneering moment for people to be able to see moving images again. Now, moving on to the crux of the matter, Auguste and Louis Lumière, two brothers who um, owned a, a factory in Lyon in France uh, that actually produced photographic film plates. They're, um, they're, actually, they're now credited with uh, inventing the first motion picture camera um, and, and it was very special, this camera. Um, they called it the cinematograph um, and that comes from the Greek for writing uh, graph uh, in movement um, um, cinema, so like kina, um, kinos in the, in the Greek. So we've now got uh, a machine that is three functions in one. Um, so they really kind of upgraded, if you like. They wanted to uh, correct the flaws that they perceived in Edison's um, kinetograph, kinetoscope, um, and actually produce a machine that would give sharper images and better illumination. Um, this actually only weighed about uh, 16 pounds as well, so it could be moved around. Um, and they did a lot of filming outside to begin with as well. Now, um, the cinematograph was manually operated by a hand crank, uh, as opposed to Edison's electrically powered camera, uh, and it wasn't very portable. And as I mentioned before, obviously only one person at a time could use Edison's kinetoscope through an eyepiece, like, in, like the peep show, like in the picture that we saw on the previous slide. However, um, the cinematograph could also project images onto a screen so that a large audience of people could view images uh, simultaneously.
And as I said, the, the images were, were better as well. So um, Auguste and Louis Lumière uh, unveiled their invention, the cinematographe, at the uh, Salon Indien du Grand Café in Paris on December the 28th, 1985. And people often consider this to be the real birth of cinema, the birth of the seventh art. And the cinematographe projected these images onto the wall, creating for the first time ever a film audience. At the time, it was a very bourgeois thing to go to the cinema because not everyone could afford to. They obviously charged people early on to see these moving images. And it was a very, very exciting time for uh, uh, um, for people to, to, to see things moving for the first time and on the wall as well. So I thought it'd be fun to have a look at some of these films. They, they showed 10 short films that night back in uh, 1895, and each one lasts about 50 seconds. Um, they are about uh, as primitive as you can get. Um, so when you have a look at these clips now that I'm going to show you, I want you to really um, uh, remember that this is uh, 130 years ago at a time when people had never even seen um, moving images before at all. And um, I often think that people might have felt a little bit like Harry Potter the first time he saw um, a wizarding newspaper and realised, or a wizarding photograph, and realised that people in the photographs actually still moved. Um, but this idea is almost magical that images, which had always been paintings or photographs till this stage, we're actually going to move. So the first one we're going to have a look at, which is one of the most famous uh, early films, is actually uh, called um, La Sortie d'Usine, uh, Workers Leaving the Factory from 1895. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this as we are as we are watching. This is the Lumière factory in Lyon, um, and it is a single static shot, uh, camera shot, with uh, dozens of men and women, workers uh, who are leaving the factory. So this is a kind of documentary film in its most elemental form, and this is how things started. This is capturing reality. So I'm going to play the. Uh, sorry, I'm going to play the clip now. I'm going to turn the music off because, in actual fact, um, of course, in those days there would have been no sound. Um, it goes without saying. Um, so this looks very, very basic, and you could even be um, uh, forgiven for saying it was a little boring, but uh, hugely significant for loads of reasons. Um, I'm going to pause it for a second. Um, already at the start um, of this, we've seen that the door, the door opened before the people started coming out. This was because uh, the Lumiere brothers wanted to frame what was happening. They knew that they only had about 50 seconds worth of film to record on, um, and they wanted to try and tell as much of a story as they possibly could. Now, there isn't much of a story, but there is what we call a narrative. Um, and here we see the people leaving at the start. They're all coming at the same time, and there's a wide variety of people as well. And you can see that they're all dressed up, and you'll see that some people are on a bike, some people are going back in. Uh, you'll see a dog making a star cameo in a moment as well. And all these things were designed by the uh, Lumiere brothers to try and show off as much as they probably, uh, as much as they possibly could. So whilst on the one hand, yeah, okay, this is quite boring, hugely significant as well. Now I mentioned reality, that this is capturing reality, this idea of documentary. But I think it's really important to 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 realise that even even with something as basic as this, um, there is always everything you see on the screen whenever you watch a film. There is always an element. Um, that the director is has made decisions and is deliberately showing you things that he or she wants you to see. And therefore, you could argue that it is very difficult to capture reality because there is always this element that it's staged in some way, like this very, very basic people walking down the street. They've made a conscious decision to film the door in that certain way, to time it in a certain way. And even in a very basic short film like this from over 125 years ago, um, there's this idea of a director making decisions about filmmaking as well, which has obviously goes on to become a lot more complex with the kind of films that we have these days when you think about locations and special effects and uh, and dialogue and music and and all these different things as well, which is, which is such important elements of films. Um, I'd like to show you another film now, which is one of the brothers. Um, this is called Repas de Bébé. Um, 
and this is one of the Lumiere brothers with his uh, beautiful wife and um, child as well. And just before I start to play the clip, I want you to think about what I just said about framing. And this is already, there's, there's been decision making, making going into this uh, as well. You can see the table in the foreground with all these different bottles on and details. You can see the family are very staged as well with the baby in the center. That's obviously a conscious decision. And you'll also see that there's movement from the trees at the background as well, which were very, very interesting for the audiences uh, at the time to see the trees moving and, and, and see the detail of the trees moving as well. You'll also notice that there is certain action at play here. The wife, uh, Mrs. Lumiere, um, is a little bit anxious, I think, and, and, and nervous and doesn't really quite know what to do with herself because she's obviously been told to move and keep on interacting. And the idea of this was to capture movement and they obviously wanted to um, celebrate their family life as well so uh, let's have a little look and you can see um, what goes on in this one here repas de bébé um, feeding of the baby uh, there's a little bit of music in this which has been added on um, again it would there wouldn't have been any music at the time but it does add a certain something to it so Lots of action, feeding the baby, wiping the baby's mouth, pretending to make a cup of tea. She's acting, even though this is realism. The baby's wondering what's going on. You wonder what they're saying as well. Looks like she's wearing her Sunday best as well. Okay, so that's the feeding of the baby. Uh, moving swiftly on to the next one. This next clip um, is the very first comedy film ever made. It's called La Roseur Arrosée, which literally means the water, wa waterer watered, or um, it, it, its other title is Le Jardinier et le Petit Espiègle, which is the, the gardener and the, and the little jester. Um, it is, as I said, the first comedy film ever made. You're going to see the gardener who's watering some plants before a naughty boy plays a nasty trick on him. So do you think back to that comment I made about staging and decisions that the directors made. The water's been cut off by the pipe, that naughty boy, but then he releases his foot, the poor waterer, the gardener, gets a <clears throat> face full of water and then he drags him back into the middle of the front over towards the camera to uh, give him a good beating for being such a naughty boy. So, by today's standard, probably not the funniest film, film <clears throat> that we've ever seen. However, um, you know, a kind of very, very basic joke, quite funny, little special effect. But also, this idea of framing comes in and, 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 and um, you know, can, can also entertain and make us laugh. So, the role of film at the start, very much a documentary, capturing reality, but also we start to see glimmers of people being entertained, people being informed as well. So film at its very basic level. And then the next uh, clip that I'm going to show you is um, very famous as well. It's called Arrivée d'un train en gare à la Ciuta, which was um, the um, arrival of the train at the station. Now, um, this one is actually um, very well known. This one was actually shot in 1896. Uh, the date's not quite wrong on there. Um, but it shows the train arriving uh, at a station and the camera was placed right at the front of the platform so that the train sweeps past the frame uh, on, a, on a kind of dynamic diagonal. Um, and people say that uh, audiences uh, were so petrified when this happened that they thought the train was going to come crashing out of the wall um, of, the, of the cafe that they were watching it in um, and, they, and they fled um, because they were so scared. Uh, I'm not sure how true uh, that legend is, um, but it does demonstrate um, that visual drama can be created by a very well-placed camera. So let's have a look at this now, the train arriving at the station. Brace yourselves.
A lot of movement again, a lot of people very well dressed. Timing is of course very important, even in these early films. There were no retakes or, or second chances because the film was so expensive to uh, to create and to produce and to, and to edit. Um, but lots of detail there. And, and these things, even though they seem quite basic to us, they would have absolutely enthralled audiences back in the day. Now, the last clip that I just want to have a, um, a brief look at is called Demolition d'un mur, which is the demolition of a wall. And what you can see here is a very, very early example of special effects with cinema. Um, and you'll see what that special effect is. Be open minded when you watch this, um, because it is um, a quite a straightforward technique, something that you can probably even do on an iPhone or on an iPad these days. But um, Again, let's think of this with our 1895 eyes, um, how thrilling and exciting it would have been to see something like this seemingly impossible for the first time. There's a bit of suspense here created with the wall falling down. And that's the first part of the film. But then they realise that, hang on, what if we decide to play the film backwards, what will that look like? So now you'll see uh, the second half of the film where it looks as though the men are going to actually cause the film, uh, cause the wall to um, re-erect and this was said to amaze audiences back in the day. Wow, breathtaking. Okay, so um, uh, before we move on to Georges Méliès, I just wanted to briefly say that the Lumière brothers then did a lot of travelling around the world and they recorded uh, themselves and they recorded scenery and footage all over the world and brought it back. There's a famous clip of them at Niagara Falls uh, and they also travelled to Jerusalem. And whilst, obviously, all the clips you've seen there, you may have realised that they all had one thing in common. Well, a couple of things in common. Obviously, they were in black and white, um, and there was no colour in film until a few years later. But all the clips that you saw, you'll notice that the camera was uh, static in all of those in all of those shots because they were, they were too big to move around, and, and the technology was not there uh, to move, to have portable cameras. But what they could do is put the camera on a moving platform, for example, a train or a, or, a, or a small carriage with wheels and move the camera that way. But it was it was very tricky to do that. But lots of clips you can find online if you wanted to see some more of these. just wanted to briefly mention Georges Méliès, uh, one of my favourite French filmmakers. Um, he's, he was actually an illusionist and he used to... Um, uh, performing uh, magic shows um, in his theatre in Paris um, but he also went on to start he he brought really um, film and theatre together and was um, is known as the kind of first um, special effects wizard and science fiction wizard of, of cinema even back um, in the early 1900s he did a lot with colour smoke um, illusion impressions um, grand costumes grand scenery and also uh, used to painstakingly paint all of the individual frames of his films so that he could add colour. And it's very basic, but it's um, it's well worth having a look up on YouTube at some of his films if this, if this interests you to see the first colour films that were there. So quick timeline again then. Uh, we look back as far as 1879 with the Zupaxis scope, the kinetoscope, the cinematograph born in 1895. First film studios um, by Georges Méliès in 1897. And then on the right, there's a few other key dates which are important. Uh, first feature film, 1911. First film with sound, The Jazz Singer, in 1927. Uh, and also Colour arriving in 1935. Uh, widescreen arrived as late as 1953. So some really key dates there. Um, if this is something that interests you and you'd like to ask any questions, please do. Um, but I would... Um, love to encourage you to go and have a look on YouTube. I mean, how lucky now that we can just um, search on the internet and see these things uh, without uh, any issues whatsoever. Um, but of course, some hugely important um, 
uh, foundations of French cinema, of, of world cinema, uh, that we can now just see at the, the click of a click of a mouse. But um, loads of influence from some of these filmmakers, even now, contemporary filmmakers claim to be influenced by Lumiere, by Méliès. Um, and if you explore more about these cinematic legends, you're sure to uh, see how their influences have lasted generations and continue to uh, inspire um, great filmmakers nowadays. And it all started over 120 years ago in a factory in France. And this is something that the French are fiercely proud of, the seventh art. Um, it remains a cornerstone of French artistic culture and something that's well financed by the French government, government as well. So um, do check out some of these films for yourselves uh, on the internet.